Welcome back everyone. In today's session, I am going to give you the line by line explanation of Macbeth Act 1 scene 7. This is a video on request. What is the setting? Macbeth's castle. Hoboys and torches enter a sewer. Originally, a sewer's duty was to taste of each dish to prove that there was no poison in it. Later, it came to be applied to the chief waiter, the chief butler, who directed the placing of the dishes on the table and divers several servants with dishes and service and pass over the stage then enter Macbeth. Dramatic significance of Act 1, Scene 7, Point Number 1. The temptation of Macbeth reaches the culminating point in this scene. And uh, here we have the famous soliloquy of Macbeth. This is a complex soliloquy which must be analyzed very closely to understand the working of Macbeth's mind. Dear girls and boys, note this down. This soliloquy must be closely analyzed to understand the workings of Macbeth's mind. A critical comment and you can use this when you are writing your long answer questions or short answer questions. The opening soliloquy is a most marvelous example of Shakespeare's immense dramatic power. Use this as your introductory statement whenever you are writing your LAQs or SAQs, short answer questions. I will help you to understand this complex soliloquy, so let us begin the explanation now. If it were done, when it is done, it, Duncan's murder. If it were done, if it were completed when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly. If this murder were done with, that is, it were to leave no trail behind it when it is committed, then it would be better to do it quickly. If the assassination, Duncan's murder, regicide, could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success. Trammel up, the expression means to catch, to entangle as in a net. A bird cannot fly away when it is caught in a trammel or net used for catching birds like patridges that hide in the grass. And to trammel up the consequences, this expression means to capture the consequences of the deed in the very doing of it, so that the consequences do not escape to plague the doer afterwards. Could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, surcease secession. It is a legal term denoting the stay of proceedings in a suit. Catch success by the death of Duncan. That but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. If this blow could be the existence and conclusion in itself. The point being made is still the same. If this blow were complete in itself and did not lead to other things. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, but here, only here, and this bank till shoal of time, bank and shoal refers to a narrow strip of land between water. The image is of a short span of life which faces an endless future after death. The eternity after life. We would jump the life to come. We would jump the life to come. We would risk the life in the next world. That is the life after death. Now the first seven lines I will explain it in detail very in a very simple manner. Just listen to me properly. Here Macbeth is analyzing the consequences of Duncan's murder. He says that if this murder could be committed without the fear of consequences, if it were an act complete in itself and were not to be followed by any retribution, it would have been better for him to commit it quickly. If the murder did not endanger his safety in this short span of life, which is nothing in comparison with the vast eternity after death, he would be prepared to risk his life to come. This is the meaning. The prospect of killing a man who is an unsuspecting guest has unnerved Macbeth here. 
and so he has come away from the table to wrestle with his conscience keep this in mind what is macbeth doing here he is wrestling with his conscience so if i had no need to fear immediate consequences i should at once kill him kill duncan moral scruples do not deter macbeth he does not care what spiritual punishment await him after death he is merely afraid of what might happen to him here if he murder duncan the earthly consequence he is worried about that he feels that uh he is still hesitant and is scared by the thought of possible consequences if he could escape suspicion possible consequences if he could escape suspicion and punishment here in this life he would not hesitate to take the risk of divine judgment hereafter but in these cases we still have judgment here so he says that judgment on our deeds always awaits us in this very world that we but teach bloody instructions which being taught return to plague the inventor so but in things like these the judgment is executed on earth itself when we murder we teach others how to murder and our actions recoil on our own heads this even handed justice what is the meaning of this even handed justice justice is being presented here with hands holding equal weights and therefore completely fair so justice which is always fair offers to us the poisoned contents of the cup which we might have prepared for someone else so today if we murder something Uh, today if we murder someone we are teaching someone else and that someone else may some day murder me murder us so this even handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice justice offers to us the poison contents of the cup chalice to our own lips which we might have prepared for someone else so in this way we may reap the consequences of our evil act justice is impartial and it forces us to drink the poisoned contents of the same cup which we have prepared for someone else or in double trust who is he duncan is here in double trust this is very very important what are the reasons why macbeth is hesitating to kill duncan we have a number of reasons the first one first as i am his kinsman and his subject duncan has come here in double trust first my being his kinsman as well as his subject are two reasons why i should not kill him duncan is entrusted to me in two ways i am his relative kinsman and his subject as well so this is number 1 kinsman and his subject strong both against the deed what is the deed assassination of duncan and what is the next reason second reason so this is reason number 1 and the second reason is as his host so i am duncan's host also who should against his murderer shut the door not bear the knife myself so as the host of duncan it is my duty to defend the king against any murderous assault rather than murder him myself so these reasons are strong enough for me not to murder king duncan besides the third reason reason number 3 besides this duncan hath borne his faculties so meek hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels a simile duncan has exercised his kingly power so gently he is such a fair and good king that this reason is also a testimony to the fact that i must not 
think about killing Duncan. Duncan has exercised his kingly power so gently. Duncan has been kind and benevolent as a ruler. Duncan is being portrayed here as a great king. So for this reason, I think I should not kill King Duncan. He has ruled so gently. He has been so fair and modest in the discharge of his royal duties that if he is murdered, his virtues will cry out to the world loudly like a trumpet. So this is important. Try to understand all these lines that his virtues will plead like angels simile trumpet tongued loudly against the deep damnation of his taking off. What is the meaning of deep damnation of his taking off? Macbeth thinks that Duncan is so blameless in his conduct as a king that his virtues will protest against his murder with the voice of angels and trumpet tongued with tongues as loud as trumpets speaking to the whole world. And the deep damnation, the outrageous deed of murdering King Duncan. Regicide is a sin. God, uh, it is believed that the king is a representative of God on earth. So if somebody kills the king, if regicide is committed, then this is deep damnation. And pity, like a newborn Naked newborn babe, again a simile, striding the blast or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye. What will happen if regicide is committed? Here, Macbeth tries to analyze the situation before resolving to murder Duncan. To begin with, he notes his double duty to the king as a kinsman and as a host. Next, he observes that Duncan has been so meek and gentle in his conduct as a king that his murder cannot go unavenged. His followers will definitely suspect the murderer and will avenge. His virtues will protest against his murder, speaking like angels through a trumpet and pity like a naked newborn baby or a cherub mounted on the invisible horses of the air will proclaim this outrageous crime to the whole world and make everyone weep. Pity is being personified here as a naked newborn baby who is typically suggestive of sympathy and compassionate feelings. Striding the blast, riding astride the storm and cherubins, cherubs, angelic children. So sightless, what is the meaning of sightless couriers of the air? Invisible, fast horses, that is the winds shall blow the horrid deed in every eye and cause it to fill with tears. When the wind of pity for Duncan blows, it will make every eye so full of tears that the wind itself will be drowned. This is the meaning of this section. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other. I have no spur to stimulate my guilty intention except ambition. Ambition which is like a too eager rider who in vaulting into the saddle overleaps himself and falls on the other side of the horse. So, to go on my purpose, to prick the sides of my intent, I do not have any other stimulus but vaulting ambition, ambition that overleaps itself. Here ambition is compared to a rider who in trying to get onto the saddle leaps too high, misses the saddle and falls on the other side. Inordinate ambition, 
may lead to my downfall so this is the soliloquy and students quickly note down these points the significance of this soliloquy this famous soliloquy reveals a medley of emotions in macbeth's heart note these points down and whenever you are writing your answers use them in your answer okay so reveal some medley of emotions in macbeth's heart first fear of the material consequences of the murder suspicion punishment i have already discussed all these things in detail this is number 1 number 2 what the your feelings the sense of kinship loyalty regard for the hallowed obligations of hospitality he is my relative i am his subject i am his host remember then admiration of duncan's personal qualities duncan as a fair king the thought of which quickly brings macbeth back to his first feeling of fear since so noble a man as king duncan will not at all unwept go nor unavenged his followers will definitely take revenge on the murderer of the king so dear students once again this is the soliloquy and the significance of the soliloquy let us now move on to the next page very quickly enter lady macbeth we have the entry of lady macbeth how now what news lady macbeth he has almost supped he king duncan why have you left the chamber macbeth hath he asked for me was king duncan looking for me lady macbeth know you not he has yes definitely don't you know that he has macbeth we will proceed no further in this business he hath honored me of late here macbeth is sharing his feelings his hesitancy with his wife lady macbeth reason number 1 for hesitating so much he hath honored me of late and i have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest gloss not cast aside so soon macbeth is vacillating this is a new word perhaps vacillation vacillating that means swaying from one side to another or hesitating here macbeth again vacillates in his resolution he tells a uh, lady macbeth that it is better for him not to murder king duncan to give up the idea of the wicked business of killing duncan why because lately he has conferred great honors on macbeth and because macbeth has won the good opinion of all kinds of people which he would like to keep fresh and shining and not throw away not cast aside so soon lady macbeth is annoyed she is irritated macbeth again vacillates in his resolution he refers to the honors duncan has lately bestowed upon him he has also won commendation good opinions commendation from all sorts of people these honors should be worn now when they are still new and shining and not recklessly thrown away in their newest gloss bright and shining unstained and cast aside discarded this is another image from clothing lady macbeth is annoyed was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself was the hope in which you once dressed yourself false drunk means false lady macbeth takes up the image of reputation as clothing another image from clothing hath it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale green sickly a color of weakness and fear as shown in the face from this time such i account thy love what is the meaning of this from now onwards i shall consider your love also to be of the same sort green and pale weak art thou afeard are you afraid to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire are you afraid to be the same person in your actions and bravery as in your desires 
Are you afraid to be the person that you would like to be? Are you afraid to do things that you would like to do? You want to become the king of Scotland, but you are afraid to do the deed. Wouldest thou have that which thou estimatest the ornament of life? Would you remain such a coward in your own eyes all your life as to let your petty fears which whisper, I dare not control your noble ambition, which cries out, I would, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon, I would, like the poor cat in the adage, like the poor cat in the proverb that would like to eat fish, but would not wet her feet. So, Lady Macbeth is saying all this so that she would chastise Macbeth into doing the deed. She ridicules his courage and his love for herself, the two things most precious in Macbeth's eyes, and adds mockingly that she would not hang back. It has been well said that Lady Macbeth is to him a fourth and worse witch within the castle. Often, Critics consider Lady Macbeth as the fourth witch because Lady Macbeth chastised Macbeth and urged him to do the deed. Macbeth, Prithi, peace, I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. I have the courage to do anything befitting a man. If someone has the courage to do more than that, he is no man at all. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? Enterprise, assassination of Duncan and the prospect of Macbeth himself becoming the king of Scotland. Then you must have been a beast when you suggested this crime to me. Lady Macbeth uses the word beast to contrast with man used by Macbeth in line 45. She seems to be saying, if you are unwilling to do now the deed that you once proposed to me yourself, you could not have been a man when you first suggested it. You must have been possessed by a beast and break this enterprise, disclose this plan of seizing the throne by murdering King Duncan. When you just do it, then you were a man. You will be able to prove yourself a man only when you dare to do this deed. Commit regicide. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time, nor place did then adhere and yet you would make both they have made themselves and that their fitness now does unmake you. And you would prove yourself more the man in proportion to your courage by being more than what you were, that is by becoming king. Nor time nor place did then adhere. Neither time nor place was then suitable for this project. But you were determined to make both time and place suitable for your purpose initially when you disclosed your deepest desire to me, when you had planned to become the king of Scotland. They have made themselves and that their fitness now does unmake you. Now look at yourself. Now both time and place are suitable. But it is this suitability itself that is destroying your self-confidence unmake you ruin your self-confidence the opportunity is here king duncan is visiting us he is in our castle the moment has come it is the right moment for us to commit the murder and the very fact that this unique moment is present is the reason you will not act so the fitness of time and place is making you Nervous. I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. How tender it is to love the babe that milks me. How affectionately the mother feels for the baby that sucks her.
I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, killed it by dashing its brain out. Here, according to Lady Macbeth, I have suckled my baby and I know how tender it is to love the baby that sucks me. But if I had sworn as strongly to kill the baby as you have done to murder the king, believe me, I would have snatched my breast from its toothless gums even as it was smiling at me and dashed out its brain. Just because Lady Macbeth paints the horrible spectacle of plucking her child from her nipple and dashing out its brain, we must not condemn her as a cruel woman. Here, she appears to be ruthless, merciless and unwomanly. But what is she trying to convey here? What is the real meaning? The real meaning is completely opposite. Here, she tries to remind Macbeth that he had made a promise and uh, she is trying to remind Macbeth of the solemnity of his promise to undertake the plot against Duncan. Macbeth had promised to kill Duncan in order to become the king and therefore he must keep his promise. He must not break the oath. Had she sworn, she would have done that which was most horrible to her feelings rather than break the oath. And she is referring to the babe that milks her because she is trying to convey that a mother and son relationship is one of the most intimate relationships, one of the closest relationships on earth. So had she made a promise, then she would have destroyed her infant to keep her promise. Macbeth, if we should fail, what will happen? Lady Macbeth, we will fail. But before that, let me just tell you another thing. These words of Lady Macbeth have also raised the question of how many children she has. But here the question is totally irrelevant. As pointed out, Lady Macbeth alludes to a child to impart emphasis to her speech. Here she is just trying to remind Macbeth that he must in no circumstances break his oath. He has made a promise. He must go to any length to keep that promise. In your give reasons, all these pieces of information are going to be really helpful. So listen to me carefully. If we should fail... As a result of Lady Macbeth's goadings, Macbeth no longer shudders at the image of murder. There is a change in Macbeth, but he still feels discouraged by the prospect of failure. His moral scruples have been partially overcome, but he feels frightened by the idea of failure followed by retribution. So, we fail. Lady Macbeth is quite convinced that they are not going to fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place and we will not fail. This famous reply can be regarded in three ways. Number one, as an, as an exclamation of disdain at the very notion of their failing. How can they possibly fail? An exclamation of disdain. Number two, as a surprised question implying that she had never thought of failure. And number three, as a quiet acceptance of the consequences of failure, implying, well, if we fail, we do and must bravely pay the penalty. The first rendering here, the first explanation seems to be the best. It harmonizes with her mocking goading tone she drives him into the deed by her scorn dear students use these terms and words expressions as well in your answers very very important but screw your courage to the sticking place and we will not fail only tighten your courage macbeth until it is firmly fixed and we shall not fail this metaphor is taken from the screw up of the cords of a stringed instrument. 
that is the harp to their proper degree of tension when the peg remains fast in its sticking place that is in the place from which it is not to move what is the metaphor the cords of string instruments like the harp screwing up these cords to their proper degree of tension when duncan is asleep where to the rather shall his days hard journey soundly invite him his two chamberlains the hard journey undertaken by the king during the day is likely to make him sleep soundly after king duncan has gone to sleep and lady macbeth is sure that after the tiresome journey of the day he will be sleeping very soundly what will she do she will make his bodyguards dead drunk with wine and merry making so that their memory supposed to keep watch over the brain will get blurred and their reason will be stupefied soundly invite him his two chamberlains attendants bodyguards will i with wine and vessel so convince that memory the warder of the brain shall be a fume and the receipt of reason a limb back only the wine and merry making will overpower them they will be overpowered their senses will be overpowered with drinking and merry making and memory which guards the brain will become a foul gas and brain itself will become an alembic stupefied memory may be described as the warder of the brain because it is the keeper of the secrets of the brain besides in shakespeare's time the brain was divided by physiologists in three ventricles memory being placed in the lowest part reason in the middle and imagination at the top so memory which stood at the junction of the brain and the spinal cord might be called a watchman guarding the secrets of the brain warder of the brain so this expression this is the meaning and memory shall be a fume the memory will disappear in a smoke of vapor the receipt of reason the receptacle of reason that part of the brain in which the reasoning faculties are lodged and limbic short form of alembic what is alembic a vessel for distilling lady macbeth here is trying to present two ideas the chamberlains will not remember what happens and number 2 indeed they will not understand it at the time when in swinish sleep their drenched nature lie as in a death what cannot you and i perform upon the unguarded duncan swinish sleep gross sleep like that of hogs and drenched drowned in drinks stupefied unguarded duncan duncan will be unguarded because his attendants will be lying in a death like slumber in a death like sleep what not put upon his spongy officers spongy drunken since they had filled themselves with drinks like sponges who shall bear the guilt of our great quell very very important so here lady macbeth appears to be practical when the guards lie in a state of drunken sleep and are dead to all practical purposes we shall be able to do anything to duncan who will then be utterly unguarded and we can even charge the drunken officers with the murder that we have committed the shrewdness of lady macbeth manipulation of lady macbeth practical nature of lady macbeth so these critical points are important once again for your answers be it give reasons mcqs or lqs or sqs macbeth bring forth men children only for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males you should give birth to male children only for the indomitable spirit you possess is worthy of bearing male children only will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have done it if we use if we smear if we stain 
the bodies of the attendants with blood after committing the murder with their own daggers don't you think it will be easily believed that it is the attendants who have murdered duncan observe how macbeth has also joined lady macbeth in plotting the murder in hatching the conspiracy undaunted metal indomitable spirit compose means breed and uh, since we shall be using for murder the daggers belonging to the attendants and after the murder smear their bodies with blood will it not be believed that it is the attendants who have murdered the king macbeth's turn it is macbeth's turn to suggest the details of the plot very important who dares receive it either as we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death who will dare to accept it otherwise than the truth for we shall make loud demonstration of our grief we will pretend to be so sad after the death of king duncan that no one will suspect us we will make a very loud expression of grief at his death macbeth i am settled and bend up i have made up my mind now i have made up my mind now and am ready i'm making each faculty of my body ready for the murder bend up strain and here the metaphor is that of stringing a bow here also we have a metaphor each corporal agent each part of my body to this terrible feat away and mock the time with fairest show deceive the world with a happy face macbeth's role here is completely different he is no longer vacillating he is no longer hesitating he has made up his mind let us go now and put on the most smiling appearances and deceive others with a happy face the theme of appearance versus reality earlier we noticed how lady macbeth had instructed macbeth to pretend to be happy and now macbeth is a changed man he too is telling the same thing that he must they must go and pretend to be happy false face must hide what the false heart doth know and innocent looking face must conceal the treachery in the heart guilty thoughts in the heart must lie hidden behind an innocent face dramatic significance of act 1 scene 7 point number 2 note this down the dominating personality of lady macbeth sweeps away all the hesitancy of macbeth and a potentially noble person finally becomes a traitor a murderer and a revolting criminal so this is very very important macbeth is transformed here into a traitor a murderer and a revolting criminal